well, we did not really contest during the Word of God. Uh, I'm just excited about what God's going to share with us tonight, uh, tonight today. Uh, last week was Father's Day, and um, we had a really great time last week. The girls all brought me kids. It was awesome. All was awesome on Father's Day. And of course, they love, they know I love Under Armour. So, you know, so they give me these bags, Under Armour bags, you know, and I'm joking. So, what could it be? What could it be? You know, it says Under Armour on it. Right? And so, but uh, they, they gave me these t shirts because they know I love wearing Under Armour t shirts. This t shirt says, The Man Big. And uh, when I got up this morning and, and I put this shirt on and I saw it said, The Man Big. And this is what the Lord said. The Lord says, Victory is not waiting for you, victory is something that you bring with you. Success is waiting for you on the other side. Remember, I said success is the thing that's up all night looking for you. Success is heard when God spoke about the promise. Success was doing this, is waiting there, pacing, asking the Father, when are you going to show up? When are you going to get here? Have they heard your word? Are they following through, through with it? That's what success is doing. Victory is something that you bring with you. And victory is something that you demand, but you, you don't demand victory externally. Victory is something that you demand from yourself. He says, so 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 as I was putting my shirt on this morning, he said, So so when you go in, he said, go in sharing them, sharing with them that victory is something that they must pursue on their own and bring with them to meet success. So success and victory have an encounter. Your part is to bring the victory. Success is already waiting. Isn't that good? So to demand victory from you, that's something that, that, that that's the your part of it. Now let's kind of recap this journey based upon that that we've been on for the past few weeks, for the past two months. All right. First we started in Exodus 33, you don't have to turn there, this is Moses and God on the mountain. And God said that he would go ahead and proclaim his name before him. And when God speaks, everything listens and responds, okay? Your past heard it, your present heard it, and your future heard it. Your past heard it and has to be readjusted. Your current heard it and is giving you the empowerment to keep moving forward. Your future heard it, and God is in your future actually preparing it for you. That's all that happens. Now, when God speaks, everything listens and responds. The presence of God is him actually imprinting his face upon you. So that now when you walk, they don't see you, but they see the God in you. Yeah. So it's, it's as if your his face is your face, and it's synonymous with him. So now as you move forward, you move forward with the presence of God with you. Amen. Now, favor is the evidence that God has been there, and that he is actually walking ahead of you. So when you show up in situations, where people, you know, where, where everybody else should have got, and you should have got the same thing. You should have had, you know, your resume on the stack with everybody else's. You, you know, you should have had the interview process like everybody else. You should have paid, been paying the same price everybody else pays. But for some reason, when you show up, you get to the head of the line. For some reason, your resume ended up at the top of the stack. For some reason, you got the discount that everybody else didn't get. That is the evidence that God has already been there before you got there. Amen? Now, when God spoke, success heard it and is also waiting for you on the other side. And like I just shared, success is, is the thing that's up at night, pacing the floors. And we talked about overcoming doubt and unbelief and fear. And when we talked about that, doubt is the one that says two things. Doubt says, God may not do this. But it also says, not only that, he may not have done it the last time. Doubt is the only one that can actually reconstruct what God has de actually put in place for you. Doubt can reach back and all the promises and all the things that you stood on, everything that you know is God, that you claim is God, that healing was God, that situation was God, that promotion was God, that situation that he brought you to was God, that, that, that loved one that came to Christ, that was God. Doubt has the only power to go back and say that wasn't God. It can actually, ch actually change your past. Now, here's what unbelief does. Unbelief comes in, and unbelief says, God can't do it. He can't, not 
what he won't, he can. And the reason he can is not because of his ability, ability, but it's because of something you did. Unbelief says God, God may do it for somebody else, but he won't do it for me. Now, now, yes, he healed somebody else, but he's not going to heal me. Yes, somebody else got out of this financial situation, but I'm not going to get out. Somebody else's marriage got saved, but my marriage ain't going to get saved. God, he, he, unbelief says he can't do it for me. Why can't he do it for me? Probably because of something in my past. I did something wrong. You know, it's, it's me. It's my situation. That's what unbelief does. So when you got doubt that says God may not do it and he ain't do it before, then unbelief jumps in and says he can't do it because of who your parents were, because what your background was. Because the situation you come from. And when you put the two together, then they call that big brother fear. And fear comes in. And fear has the ability to immobilize and stop you right where you are. And, and, and when you put them all together, most people find their lives stuck in this capsule right here. Doubt, unbelief, and fear. Doubt, unbelief, and fear. Doubt, unbelief, and fear. And they're locked. And, 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 and we call it, now this is what we call it in, in, in the church. We call it a stronghold. You're held there by an outward strength that you have submitted to. Man, that's good. You're held there by an outward strength that you submitted to. It has no power, but we give it power. And that's what happened to them in Numbers 13. They, they, they just could not get past that. They got scared because they saw giants in the land. Now, God told them about all the other tribes, but never told them about the sons of Anak, the giants in the land. All the scriptures leading up to that, God told them about the Jebusites, the Hittites, the he told them all the tribes that they were going to drive out, but he didn't tell them about the giants. And God oftentimes does not share the big picture because if he were to share with us the giants that we would have to overcome, we may never move forward. If God were to show you because see we we love for God to show us you know our, our future in the sense of all the you know prosperity and the wealth and it looks good and beautiful but if he were to show you the giant that you have to overcome to get that because we we don't see the giant all we see is promised land that's it but if he were to say okay yeah there's a promised land there but there's several giants that you're gonna have to overcome I don't know if I want that land I'm good for you, the land that's going to be fruitful. I'm trying to take you back to Eden when everything was provided for you. Well, I took care of everything for you. Your wildest dreams will be fulfilled. It's like living in Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to have to deal with some giants to get there. We may never go there. So here we find ourselves faced with a spiritual truth and a frightening reality. How do we overcome doubt, fear, and unbelief to transfer that which is spiritual into the natural so that the evidence of the promise will be made manifested in our reality? I'm going to say that again. How do we overcome doubt, fear, and unbelief? Remember the capsule, the stronghold. So that we can transfer that which is spiritual into the natural so that the evidence of the promise will be made manifested in our reality. Now here was the spiritual truth they got in Exodus 3.8. This is the first time God told Moses about milk and honey. Exodus 3.8. He says, so I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites. The evidence that the promise existed was the fruit that they brought back and what they witnessed from spying in the land in Numbers 13. Now, when they sent out the spies, they found proof that this was the promise. 
you know, they, they, they actually witnessed and saw this is the land. Mm -hmm. They brought back the fruit and tasted some of the fruit to witness that this is where it's supposed to be. And what I'm, what I'm feeling so passionate about this morning is that many of us have tasted and seen, yes. but we have not declared the Lord is good. Mm -hmm. See, it's a three-part process. You taste, you see it, but you have to declare the Lord is good to receive it. And see, many times we can taste the goodness of God. We, we, we can see it in somebody. You can, you can be introduced to somebody. You can meet somebody. You can see it on it. You'll just know that's God. And then you're witnessing and, and actually know I'm supposed to be. That's my thing. This, you know, you get energized. It's like, yes, I see where I'm going. I see what I should be doing. I see where, I, where, where my career should be taking me. I see where, where this business venture should be taking me. I see where this church should be going. You, you taste it and you see it, but then you stop right there. Because the declaration actually, actually brings you in contact with it. And see, many of us have tasted and seen, but we have not declared the Lord is good in order to receive it. And so if you don't do that part, you can't transfer that which is spiritual into the natural. There were giants in the land. And not just that, but they were small in comparison to them. And they even said... We're not only small in our eyes, but we're small in their eyes. And, and we, we talked about this. How can they even know how they looked in their eyes unless they walked into this thing small-minded from the beginning? Right. And so we can't, you can't walk in with a small mindset and perceive that they see you the same way. And they perceive not only that, they're not going to let us get into the promised land. The land that God said is theirs. The size of the giant you are facing is in direct proportion to the purpose purpose you're trying to obtain. Good word. Yeah. Amen. The giant could be 20 feet tall. The pressure from that giant can be huge. The intimidation factor can be ginormous. But the reason that giant is so big is because the calling you got is equally as big, if not bigger. Amen. And see, success, success is not a big guy. Success is like Samson. If you, if you read the archives and in the Bible, so Sam, Samson was not a huge, huge guy, even though in all the cartoons they make him super huge and they're like, Arnold Schwarzenegger, somebody playing him. He was not a big guy because if he was huge, then he wouldn't have needed the Lord's strength when it came upon him. If he was physically big, if he was physically strong, if he was physically ginormous, then he wouldn't need a God's strength to whip all them Philistines. He could have did it on his own. But what they talk about Samson is Samson was an average guy with long hair. And because God anointed, it said when the spirit of the Lord came upon him, yes. his strength yes. came out. Yes. And see, so success is like Samson. It's not a really, really, really big guy. Matter of fact, in comparison to the giant, He's about six feet tall, probably about 5'11", 185 pounds, probably built my lead, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course, of course, of course he is. But success is standing on the other side of this 20, 25 foot giant mm -hmm. saying, demand victory. Yes, come on. Demand victory. Yes. Look at my shirt. You can do it. You can do it. Don't, this dude, you can knock him out. Come on. You can take him down. Come on. Don't worry about him. Come on. Even he may be yelling, hitting his shield, screaming and spitting and everything at you. Don't let that distract you. All you got to do is like David did, pick up a rock and throw it at him and watch him fall. That's what success is doing. Come on. So we're going to walk through this because this is going to be really good. It's already good, but this is going to get better. All right. So with all this going on, how do we move that which we desire from the spiritual into the natural? How do we go from purpose to victory? So let's walk this out. You have a passion, a goal, a destiny, a calling. 
This could be a career path, a business venture, a health goal, family strife challenge, a youth situation. The passion, the destiny, the goal, the desire is spiritual. Now, I'm going to say that again because we're going to expound on that. That passion, that destiny, that goal, that desire you have, that, that thing that you're, you're wanting to, to make manifested in your life, that thing is spiritual. Now, many of you may have, have, may have already learned this. We're going to go back through this just you know, to make sure we're all on the same page that you're a three-part being. You, know, you have your, your body, your soul, and your spirit. Three parts to you. The body we call the flesh. Your flesh is just that. It's the flesh. It submits and is trained to respond. Okay, now, we, we, you, there's a thing that you've heard called muscle memory. All right, like when I play the piano, it's just muscle memory. My fingers just know what to do. It just it remembers that. Now, it did not initially know that. I trained it to do that. It's the same thing with anything. Your muscles can be trained to do things. Now, oftentimes, we give that credence in life, but it's not life. It was just trained to do it. Okay, and so the body is... It's just that. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. Your mind can only gauge things. It can only take in information, sort it in an appropriate, organized fashion, and then make a conscious decision based upon what it's taken in. Then your emotions help you to solidify your decisions. It, it, it's, it's like your, your emotions give your will a basis to move from. You know, like, like if, to, if you find something you like or you don't like. I mean, how many people in here love cheesecake? Yeah. No, no, I said love cheesecake, not like it. <laughs> love cheesecake, all right? See, the fr now I know people who don't like cheesecake. I don't know what's wrong with those people. <laughs> Do you know that at the Last Supper, they had cheesecake? All right. <laughs> Uh, they, probably, they probably didn't have to. The bread was cheesecake. All right. All right, all right. He cut a slice. All right. No, you didn't. All right. No, you didn't. Let's get spiritual again. All right. The first time I had cheesecake, it was an emotional thing. My mind said cheesecake. My emotion said, yes, Lord. So anytime I have a slice of cheesecake, that experience comes back. I like cheesecake. Cake. I want some today. Now, I know people who don't like cheesecake. They didn't have the same emotional experience I had. You know, now, I'm not a fan of chocolate. I'm just, I'm just not, a, I'm not a fan of chocolate. But my wife, there, there's a fan and then there's brandy. And I promise you, it is an emotional experience to just watch her eat chocolate. And Publix has these ganache cakes. Yeah, they have right now, it's on sale if you want to go get it for $19.99. Normally it's $24.99. You get $4.99 off, right? It's called a chocolate grandeur cake. That is chocolate cake with chocolate ganache. Now, I'm not a chocolate fan, but I like it. But she has an emotional attachment to these cakes where it, it's not just a slice. It's a half that she thoroughly enjoys. Now, I'm not a fan of cheesecake. I didn't have that emotional attachment, so my mind, will, and emotions are not attached to, no, I mean, attached to chocolate. It's attached to cheesecake. Hers is attached to chocolate. That's all you your will and emotions do. They don't, they don't do anything more than take in information, sort it out, develop an emotional attachment to the things you like and the things you don't like. Right. That's all it is. Now, the reason I want you to understand these two things in just very easy terms is because when we talk about the spirit, it's going to blow your mind. Amen. Okay, so the flesh is just trained. That's all it is. Your mind, will, and emotions, which is your mind, and your emotions just attach you to like this, don't like this, do this, don't do this, want this, don't want that. That's all it is, okay? Now, your spirit is your creator and it's the closest piece and in some terms it is the actual piece of God now most most scholars will say it's the closest piece because they're scared of saying the latter part okay but I'm I'm not afraid the scripture says, who is man that you have not made him? And in the Bible it says a little lower than the angels, but they didn't understand it because the actual term says a little lower than yourself. So God actually replicated himself. 
itself in man. So your spirit is the exact replication of God's spirit in man. Do you understand? He gave man dominion over the earth, but that was a natural thing. You have dominion over the earth because you are a piece of me on this earth. Amen. So, so, so your spirit is the creator. Your spirit discovers. It goes beyond time and space. Your spirit can travel beyond time and space. Your spirit transcends natural world and reality and processes beyond what it sees because it in itself is a transcendent being. I know this is real spiritual scientific, but just follow me. Your spirit, when, when your body dies, your spirit does not die. Matter of fact, your spirit cannot die because God cannot die. And you're a piece of God. You understand? So your spirit is the thing that's the closest part to God. Your spirit is not, it's not held by time. Your spirit's not held by this. Now we convince ourselves that we're held by time. We convince ourselves that we're held by the natural plane. But if you were to close your eyes and use your imagination yes. the way it was supposed to be made, you know, you're, you, you can take yourself to outer space and back and affect of a second you you can you, you can travel the world in a fraction of a second you know you can dream at night and your spirit can go places that your flesh and your mind can't even comprehend and see some people would just say well that's pizza <laughs> or oh, I had ice cream too late oh, that was the yeah. chocolate cake it was, it was chocolate cheese <laughs> Which is even better. <laughs> but the reality is when you awaken to what that truly is, it's your spirit. If you look through the Bible, most of the prophetic visions that they got was when they were sleeping. He said, and I dreamed vision. And I was here. Most of it, the spirit yes. was traveling. Now, once you, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna stay on this spiritual thing. And, and the reason is, is deep waters. Uh, as I begin to process, and I said, Lord, these, this is real spiritually deep. I'm like, okay, now we're going really, really, really spiritually deep. But what the Lord said was this. He said, there's a spiritual depth that they have to be aware of. Y'all already aware of your flesh. Right. We're already aware of our flesh. We're already aware of our mind, will, of emotions. We stay in that all day long. Yes. We very rarely tap in to the spirit even though that's the place where your dreams come from amen. amen all right so let's keep going the spirit lives on both sides so out of the three your spirit is the only one that, ha that has absolutely no limitations so from your spirit is where your passions or your calling come from your spirit is the only part of you that can travel and step with god we talked about that all discoveries unknown start here so from this place, you desired, ventured to come up with something that is not presently in your reality. You know, whatever, if it's a job promotion, it's, a, it's to get out of debt, it's, what, it's whatever, whatever that thing is that's currently not in your reality, you're, from your spirit, you came up with this, I want this, that, and the other. The first step in bringing that which is spiritual to manifest in the natural is to get the promise. A promise is a word of confirmation and encouragement. It tells you that you're on the right path. It's a word from God. We talked about this. When situations, circumstances, and people line themselves in a coincidental fashion. That's what we call the word of God. The promise is your spiritual anchor. Just like your emotions are your mental and physical anchor, it's your first natural sign. It's your did God really say. And, 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 and when I got to that point, the Lord said this. You need to ask yourself that question before the devil does. You, you need to ask yourself, did God really say before the giant shows up, before the enemy shows up? You need to have an answer to that question that is so assured in you that when the enemy does come in, because he's going to ask you the question, you have to be able to say, yes, he did. And this is why. This, see, th Doubt can't come in and unravel your past. Because you can say, listen, when, when the enemy comes and says, did God really tell you to start that church? 
Yes, he told me to start that church. He was preparing me since I was two years old to start this church. I've been preaching and teaching in the Word and the body of Christ since I was 12 years old. I've been ministering to the youth for the past two years. I was a backup teacher for the past eight years. Of course he told me to start this church. I've got too many words. Jason Hutchins gave me a word. Prophet Robert gave me a word. Kevin LeBron gave me a word. I'm, 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 I can walk away and say all those words. So if God didn't say it, that means all of that is a lie. And all that... So did God really say? Yes, he said it. See, so doubt can't. It can't commit because I already answered the question before the question was asked. And see, the minute you set out and start moving down any direction, you got to answer that question for yourself. And you, and, and you can't just say, well, yeah, that ain't going to work. You deal with a giant, that ain't going to work. You got, you got to be so convinced in your heart. This is God. And ain't nothing going to change it. The devil shows up and asks the question. You got to answer for him. Did he say it? Yes, he did. Ask yourself that question before the enemy comes. After, because he's not after you. He's after your vision. He doesn't mind you staying right where you are. He's good with that. Yep, you've gotten this far, well done. Park it. He's after the vision you have. Yes. And see, he can't destroy, he, he can't destroy the vision because the vision came from your spirit. But he can plant doubt and unbelief in the promise so the vision never manifests itself. He prefer you to die with your vision. He, he, all he wants to bring is enough doubt and unbelief so that the vision never shows up. And see, Les Brown said this. He said, the graveyard is the richest place on earth because it is here that you will find all the hopes and dreams that were never fulfilled, the books that were never written, the songs that were never sung, the inventions that were never shared, the cures that were never discovered, all because someone was too afraid to take the first step. Keep with the problem or determined to carry out their dream. The enemy is seeking to destroy your vision by attacking the promise. So we have to anchor ourselves in the promise by securing ourselves in the word that we received. My oldest daughter has been looking for a job. And I taught her, uh, one of the things I taught her is when you want something, there's two things you have to do. I said, the first thing is you write it down. You write it down. Write the vision down. Make it plain on tablet so you can run with this thing. So you write it down. I said, number two is you pray that thing every day, two or three times a day. And I sent her these prosperity scriptures, and I broke them up over a course of 30 days. And I said, baby, you read your vision. You read the scriptures and pray. And you do that every day and every day and every day. And so she's sticking with the promise. Now, she's doing it and applying for jobs, doing it and applying for jobs, doing it and applying for jobs. And she's been applying and been applying and been applying. And then she started, now she's starting to get interviews. And the interviews, she's starting to now decide, do I want this job or not that job? Do I want to be dealing with this or not dealing with that? Do I want to go this way or not go this way? And so now she's going through and filtering through all the jobs. And now she just got a call back from the job she really, 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 really wanted. But she had the opportunity to get rid of all the stuff she didn't want to get to the place of the vision that she really wants. And now that door is opening up because she's stuck with the promise. Amen. Now, now, take that story and just add it and insert it in your life somewhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just put it somewhere where you have need uh, or where you have want. Just stick it there and go, okay, now, if I, if I hear the promise, I read the promise, I write down the vision, I pray it every day, and now I just trust God. And here's what God does. You've done all you can to stand now. Yes. Now God does his part and runs ahead of you and starts putting things in place for you to walk into. Glory to God. 
See, when God said, I go ahead of you, many of us thought that I'm walking like this and God's walking in front of me. Let me tell you what God does. You could be walking in a zigzag pattern. You could be going up and down. God, because he looks from a, a bird's eye view, can see where you're headed. Run up ahead of where you're about to run into and drop your need so that when you walk, you walk right into that thing. See, there was this, there, there was this game that, that Waze had, right? We, and we, me and the girls used to play it. And you had to drive into the ghost. It was crazy. It was a GPS thing. So you had your GPS, and they have these little ghosts. You're playing Pac-Man, like, in Cherokee County. <laughs> and they had these little ghosts that they would have planted, and you would have to run into them to get points. And so we'll be driving home, and I'll be like, oh, babies, hold on. And they'll be like, Dad. And I'm like, don't worry about it. I see something. And so I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be going down back streets to run into the bonus and, and, and to run into, you know, extra coins and, and to run into extra life. Come on. And to run any of these things so that and they would strategically place them in front of me so that when I was driving they knew where I was going because they knew my driving pattern and so I would end up driving into these things and I would get more points and I would get more lives and I would get more favor and I'd get more healing and I'll get more advancement and my career would go up because this thing knew where I was going and would strategically place itself in front of me and God goes ahead of you. And when you begin to walk in the promise, he knows where that promise is going to take you. So now you're just standing on the promise doing what you normally do and all of a sudden you run into favor. All of a sudden you run into advancement. All of a sudden you walk, run into a free vacation. All of a sudden you walk into a job and they say we've been waiting for you. We've been looking for you. All of a sudden you get a book in the mail and it's like I've been wanting something like this because God already has those things planned ahead of you. Yes. Hallelujah. God, Jesus so good. Hallelujah. Listen, we, we got to get this in us. Yes. Because we're working too hard. Yes. Working way too hard to get something that's already there yes. for us. Yes. When he says to rest, we need to rest. See, now all the other scriptures begin to make sense. Now the more that you can bear, scripture fits in. Yes. Because it's not more that you can bear under the burden or temptation that you're facing. But it's more than you can bear under the giant that you have to overcome for your vision to be made manifest. Your vision and your purpose is bigger and larger than that thing in front of you. Now here's what's powerful about this. We're going to close here. Joshua was one of the spies that went into the land. Joshua and Caleb both came back with good reports. Joshua knew that there were giants in that land. Yes. Joshua chapter 1, God says, my man Moses is dead and I'm sending you with these people. Be bold and courageous as I take you into the land that I promised you. Joshua begins to go into the land and take the land. And you get to Joshua 11.21. At that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites Amen. from the hill country, from Hebron, Deber, and Adam, from all the hill country of Judah, from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. Come on. Come look. God has made the promise. All we have to do is walk it out. Yes. That's it. There's, there's, there's. Uh, 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 uh. All right. Let me read this word, and then I'll get to what I just felt there. The Lord gave me this word at the end. He says, I am reestablishing a foundation on these things, these principles, because I am calling you to stretch your faith and to go beyond your current thinking. I have given you an imagination to solidify, to thought, my promise. Do you dwell in it richly or do you let it go to waste? Have you reached 
satisfaction, compromise, complacency, or made a treaty with your current life? Or are you willing to move past your comfort zones and find new pastures flowing with new wine? And he closes with this. I'm asking, will you be my new wineskins? Will you be my new wineskins? God is looking for a people that will believe him enough to allow him to manifest his goodness in their life so big that you don't have to tell nobody about it because they'll see it and run to find out the God you serve. Amen. I am so convinced of that. I'm so convinced that that is the new evangelism. I'm so convinced that that is the new way we're going to reach this world. I'm so convinced that that is the new way we're going to change this generation. That's the new way we're, we're going to bring financial peace and, and prosperity to the kingdom of God. I'm just so convinced that that is going to be the separation because right now the world doesn't see any difference between those who go to church and themselves. Yeah. And so that's, that's why they don't want to come to church because most of the church is in debt just like they in debt. And most of the church is going through financial problems and marital problems just like they going through financial problems and marital problems. Most broken homes are in the body of Christ just like they are in the world. So why would the world come to a church that looks like them but speaks another language? But I promise you that once the miracles of God start showing up in your life, it yeah. changes the family dynamic. It changes the home. It changes the person to where now they're not trying to walk in this thing in their own effort. They're walking out the call of God and purpose in their life. And people see you living by purpose, living by those principles, living by your calling. And they're going to want to be like you. They're going to want to be like us. I am convinced that is where deep waters are supposed to go. Hallelujah. And when the Lord asked me that, he said, will you be my new wineskins? We got to answer that question. Yes. Because if you know the scriptures, the old, you can't pour new wine in the old wineskins because it'll burst and waste it. You have to pour new wine into new wineskins. The wine always represented his Holy Spirit. And he wants to pour out something fresh and new into us. Yes. It's his glory. He wants to pour out something fresh and new, but he can't pour it into us when we have the same thinking and the same mindset. Yes. He wants to pour it into somebody who goes, Lord, I give it to you. Yes. So we're going to end a little different today. If we can bow our heads. Because God is asking us that question. And we have to answer it. Father God, right now, we submit our faith to you. Father, we right now repent of our thinking has not gone beyond ourselves, not gone beyond our comfort zone, not gone beyond the things that make us feel good. Father, we repent if we have limited you in any way. If we have put confines around you and said, you can't. I can't. If we allow doubt and unbelief and fear to get in the way, Lord, a stronghold, 
that we have voluntarily given ourselves to. Father, we can't without the name of Jesus. Father, we can't ask that, answer that question until we deal with this place. Father, you're not asking us that question based upon what we actually can do. You're not, you're not asking us that question based upon our own righteousness. You're not asking us that question based upon our own self-good. Father, there's nothing good in us. So Lord, you're not asking us that question based upon the way we've actually lived and did this, that, and the other. You're asking us that question based upon the way, the, the way you live, the way your son has lived, what he has redeemed us from. Father. You're asking us that question based upon your kingdom. And from that place, Lord, let us respond. All those other things, Lord, you'll work out if we start living by purpose. All those other lifestyle changes will come if we start living by our calling. So, Lord, we get our thinking right. Lord says, will you find me that I may pour out a supernatural portion into your life that will be so huge you couldn't hide it in the end of your life. Will you give me the privilege with an honor? And if your answer is yes, stand up. Jesus. We re-engage. We re We demand. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We re Yes, We demand. Please, we are walking with us this week. Yes, 
We, end up, we always end up with like eight things of potato salad. <laughs> it's like the default picnic. <laughs> and so, so we can have you know, what we're going to bring and everything, and then we'll let everybody know this week. So if you're looking on Facebook for as well, so Angel, if you can wait in the back, so just stop by the table on the way out, see Angel, so she can get your information. Let us know. Peter, and so we can let you guys. Um,